I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, here in Houston, it's supposed to be an interesting night because of the storms. So uh, we're going to see, try to get out of here no later than nine tonight because uh, oh. like Bob and you, we, we've got quite a few ways to go. Who are you? They, they, uh, that? Me. Said that? <laughs> who said, who are you? You might be. Oh, you didn't Individuals just troublemaker. Sorry, Mike. For those of you who don't know, I'm Joe Thompson. <laughs> Chapter president in training <laughs> uh, of the Houston chapter. Welcome, everybody. It's glad to have baseball back, right? Um, Bob let me know uh, when I was on my way to Florida last week. Negotiations are taken care of. Things are back to normal. So, keep saying that. Somebody keep saying hello. Okay, keep going. All right. All right. So, um, I had a great trip to Florida for spring break. My wife and I took a cruise for our anniversary. It was uh, pretty fun. Took Bob's advice. Didn't quite eat as much as I could have ate. So, swam with the dolphins. Pretty great. So, anyway, um, we're just going to talk about a few things because I want to turn it over to our special guest, Gaspar. Uh, how, about, how do I say that? Gaspar. It's Gaspar. Gaspar? All right. All right. I'll probably forget here in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> Can I ask one thing before we start? Go ahead, Scott. Uh, I'd like to uh, make an announcement. I have some spring training tickets for all the Astros games. We're going to be seeing, I think, four of them, but the next two are available for anybody who's going to be in West Palm Beach and wants to get a couple of seats with parking or the next couple of exhibition games with the Astros for their home. Let me know after. I'll just give it to you. Yeah. Well, there you go. Oh, there you go. Free tickets to the exhibition games. The next Thanks. two. I can't remember who the team are. Okay. Thanks, Scott. That's pretty cool. Um, all right. Well, if you don't know, registration for the Sabre 50 is underway in Baltimore, August 16th through the 21st. Um, I registered uh, last week, and the hotel for the convention is the High Regency Inner Harbor, right? Uh, it's $199 a night for a special rate, uh, you know. It's about parade for Baltimore, I guess. Um, I mean, what is that? Uh, tank of gas now? <laughs> Something like that. So, um, well, I'm trying. You know. I've already taught two times today. <laughs> I've been dealing with kids all day. It's just back from spring break. Yeah, just back from spring break. They were asleep for half a day. But um, if you haven't had a chance to register, I highly recommend you go ahead and uh, register and if you want to get a room they sell out pretty quick 199 because i was looking at some of the other hotels it's kind of pricey but 199 is a good deal if you want to go um the astros win contest when was the last time we did it bob last year last year yeah okay uh we're gonna go ahead and do it again this year um her the chapter vice president now has volunteered to accept everybody's predictions. Okay? So whatever you think the Astros win total for this year is going to be, go ahead and email her. Uh, as a tiebreaker, we're also doing the, almost said skaters, we're, almost, we're also doing the Space Cowboys wins contest. So not only guess how many wins the Astros are going to have, but also the Space Cowboys, who are playing 150 games, by the way. 150 games. So, um, I don't know what we're going to do. The winner usually, we get a pat on the back, but I'm trying to clean my stuff out of my library. I'll, you'll probably get something from me, the winner. So, <laughs> things like that. So, um, so even, what? I appreciate it. All right, thank you, guys. That's pretty valuable, man. <laughs> Might have to sell a couple things for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Yeah, that, yeah, tell me about it. Um, very quickly, Tony, you and Scott, do you want to say anything about the newsletter? Uh, if people want to submit articles. Okay, Tony, tell yeah. them. Okay. Where'd Tony go? We come, back, we come back to Tony. We'll come back to Tony. All right, just let us know. Tony, hey, Scott. Scott, can you hear me? This is Paula. Yeah, I hear you, Paula. Great. Okay, so you, uh, Tony's using my computer. He's unmuted now. Here he is. Goodbye. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you want to see Enjoy. the newsletter when everything is done? Oh, I can hear You're on, Tony. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Tony, you want to say something about the newsletter when uh, when the next one's coming out? If people want to submit articles, well, we think it'll be. I think we've uh, Scott has agreed that we'll get something out by tax time, April fifteenth, the Ides of April. Um, right. One of the well, articles that's, I that's a for articles. We're looking for the end of April is that's the next issue. Okay, the due date is April fifteenth, tax day. That's right. And uh, yes. publication at the end of April, right? Yeah, that's right. Sure, could use some more articles. So anybody who feels like they're uh, got their writing juices flowing, let's see them. Maxwell, you want to write an article for the next newsletter? Maxwell, it's having pop my ears today. Maxwell, can you hear me? I can hear you. You wanna you wanna write something for the next newsletter? Um, I'd love to. I don't know if my work schedule will allow it. It's uh, tax season, okay. morning, noon, and night where I am, but um. If not the next one, I'll, I'll probably submit something for the following one. Okay. Well, anybody in person here hey, Joe. Or on Zoom who wants to write something, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Joe, uh, this is Tony. Yeah. I, could, I could write something up about the uh, decision today from uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals about Major League Baseball, the Red Sox, the Yankees, and uh, trying to keep certain letters out of the uh, public arena. Yeah, if you haven't heard today, a uh, appeals court – that that the Yankee letter can be unsealed. Ooh. So uh, the story behind that is uh, the sign stealing scandal. This should be an interesting couple of weeks. Yeah, they, uh, that, right? they also dismissed the, uh, they, they affirmed the dismissal of the allegations of fraud made by these people from DraftKings of all things. I think the, the clubs entered into some sort of devil's agreement with DraftKings and that opened the door for this lawsuit. Well, there you go. There you go. All right. Um, Mike. Yes. You want to say something about our uh, vintage team before you make our announcement about next month? Before you make, do you have anything about the vintage team? No, but I like the welcome vintage. Where are you? You're right behind the column. Mm. You're behind the column. I can't see you. Oh, Bill Burton's wife. Shirley. Shirley. Hey, Shirley, how you doing? Michelle. Nice to have Shirley. Bill Burton's wife. Hey, you, David. Hello. Hello. All right. Second. Right. Yeah. 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 Shirley Deacon says hello. Hello. It's nice, it's nice to be here on your meeting night. <laughs> we are honored to have you. Thank you. Oh, boy. Thank you. Hey, Mother. And David, your book comes out in June, right? Yeah, it will come out on June 17th. Uh, that's what I've heard. It's wrong. Right. David Jerome yeah. wrote an autobiography about Bill Burden coming out the 17th of June. It's so, we're all looking forward to it. It's ready for free order yeah, on Amazon. It's ready for free yeah, order on Amazon and whatever it is. Well, I'm still working on the vintage game. I haven't done very good job on it. But, uh, Mike, yeah, you have to come up. <laughs> yeah, we're running late. All right. There I am. <laughs> okay, so I'm still trying to do the vintage thing. I was hoping to do it this month, but the weather's been so bad and I took vacation, so I haven't had a lot done. Uh, ticket for the Skeeters game are going to be uh, Space Cowboys. Space Cowboys are going to be April 16th. We have a, the game's at six o'clock, so they open the gates at five. 
Mike Kapp has already agreed to talk when he was at our meeting. I can't quite get Deacon to commit yet, so uh, hopefully he'll be able to talk to us then too. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I found out I've got a vacation that week. I'm going to Tampa and I land at four o'clock Saturday. So I'm gonna need somebody to take over the tickets. I can arrange everything. I talked to Sam Stubbs today and he's gonna call me tomorrow to confirm. We need uh, tickets to be $55, which is five bucks off the regular 60. We get the meal, the dinner, we get the air conditioned suite. With pre game meeting, we get ice cream in the fifth, Lou. Uh, if you're enjoying your dessert, uh, it's not dessert, but anyway. Uh, so if anybody can kind of take over that ticket stuff, I don't leave till Tuesday that week, so we need a minimum of 20 people, including wives. So that's just 10 couple, and uh, should be a good game. We're playing the Rangers, like I say, my caps is going to be there, and uh. When he was here last month, he said he would participate. He doesn't have to be on the radio, but uh, yeah. so y'all, we need a vote. Are y'all in favor of doing that? I mean, how many people want to go? Yeah. yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. All right. With wives, that, that's an easy twenty people that aren't here. So I'll confirm that for him tomorrow. Uh, we'll send out my email uh, address and my home address if you want to send checks, but I've got to get them in before I leave for vacation. And then normally you go on, you've been doing prepaid the parking, you save five bucks or two. And you go on the website and pull your tickets down. They don't hold them for you anymore. So you just download them off the website. Okay. okay, so get your money to me ahead of time. I'll do what I can before you leave, and then it's up to you guys. And I'll, I'll try to see how fast Southwest flies you back home. Yes, All right, Mike, thanks. All right, thanks for taking care of that. Welcome. All right, so uh, tonight we have a uh, special presentation of a film all of us are looking forward to uh, watching. We have a guest star from the film here tonight, Deacon. <laughs> Deacon is with us. Gaspar and uh, Vinny. Uh, Gaspar, you want to talk a little bit about the film before we start it? You can have Deacon up here if he wants to say something, or you don't have well, to get up. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to say how um, you know how happy I am to be here tonight. Um, it's always nice to be in Houston, even if it's virtually. Um, and I want to say hello to my friend Deacon Jones. Um, Deacon, how are you? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> ah, there you go. Deacon, Deacon and I, Deacon Great. and I talk about, about Deacon, we talk so about what, see you. Times, right here, Deacon. Right here, Deacon. We talk, we talk, what, maybe two, three times a year? Yes, and uh, quite. I think we're due. Let's talk, too. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job on the film. I, and a great friend. And I, it, I, yeah, I, well, you are, like you are as well. You are as well, my friend. It's, it's nice Thank to see you. I want to cut in and the two people on the, on the, uh, we call it the Zoom oh, here tonight, but I'm Tal Smith. I want to publish, congratulate public interest of the year, one of y'all. Long overdue, Tal. And Shirley Burton, my goodness. God bless you. God bless you. Hello. Hello. My favorite, my favorite man. He was a man's man. <laughs> Every time he was so stoked, and when he got upset, you know, ball play didn't run a ball out or something like that, you see that veins got swapped. <laughs> <laughs> kept, kept the same composure, but you knew, you knew somebody was going to do that. Uh, he didn't care if you were Caesar or Daniel Bob, he didn't care who you were, if you didn't run hard 90 feet. Something wrong with the legs, young man. Why don't you sit down with me and watch the game? <laughs> I love my man. Charlie, really so nice to see you. You and Tal and John have been friends forever. I just wanted to interject that closer. The Gasper, the movie again, I, I'd forgotten that they were going to put this film on tonight. Yeah. So uh, I got here, here again. 
And they were great, man. I tell you, she's that was some night, wasn't it? Well, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want me to just maybe give just a very brief introduction to the film and then I guess we're gonna watch it. Yes, I would assume that. Yeah, that's how that's how good. Go ahead. Yeah, so so the the idea for the film came from Matt Jacobson, um, who's actually in the film. Uh, he's a very distinguished historian at Yale University, and Matt was working on a cultural history of the civil rights movement, and he got interested in the question of, um, you know, how long it actually took baseball to uh, integrate, um, and you know, the more he looked into it. You know, the more you realize that this, you know, obviously was a decades long process um, where you had, you know, you had black and Latino players, because our film actually has both, um, who were integrating the minor leagues well into the 1960s. You know, so, I mean, we, you know, we all know about Jackie Robinson in 1947 and Brooklyn and all that. Um, but what we set out to do with this film is to kind of give people an appreciation for how long integration took um, and, and to kind of um, introduce them to some folks who maybe are not associated with the integration of baseball, um, but were certainly part of that. Um, so that was, that was basically, that was the impetus for the film. Um, so maybe we should just watch it. Uh, it's, it's a short, it, it was a broadcast hour. It was broadcast on TV One in 2018, um, and it was a broadcast hour. Uh, but once you take all the commercials away, I think our running time is like 42 or 43 minutes. Um, so it's it's you know um, it sh it should play uh, it should play nicely. Um, so yeah, and then uh, I'll be on the other side to uh, talk about it a little bit more and answer questions and. Uh, Deacon is terrific in the film. Um, I told him he was going to get a Screen Actors Guild card, um, but I don't. I, I was. I was joking. You don't, you actually don't get those for documentaries. But if you could, Deacon would have one. Um, so yeah. So that's that's it. Okay. Fine. All right. Um, thank you, Gaspar. Um, sure. We can go ahead and uh, watch the film. And Vinny, uh, after Gaspar talks after the film, you can tell us about the project you were doing with your students, Vinny. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. All right. All right. So here we go. Let's try this. That was wonderful. Wonderful. How was that? How was the, how was the, how was the sound? I'm sure the sound quality wasn't great. But... I think we understood it. All right. <laughs> great. So uh, you just want to talk some more? You just want to open it up to questions? What do you want to do? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to just open it up and see, you know, I'll talk about whatever people are uh, interested in talking about. Okay. Anybody got a question online here? I have a question. That's a 42 minute show, but I'm sure you had a lot of other stuff that you couldn't include in the time. So yeah, was there, oh yeah. I mean, you can almost do a whole movie on Dick Allen's career, it sounds like, and even Kirk Flood, if you, if sure. somebody wanted to the time sure. in. Yep. So how, so how much did you have left over kind of thing? Uh, we had a lot. So without getting into the details, so this was originally, we got a big NEH grant, National Endowment for the Humanities. And this was originally going to be um, a PBS film. And it was originally going to be uh, like a 90 minute film. Um, but we had some issues with PBS. Um, Ken Burns at the time was working on his Jackie Robinson film. Um, and the feeling was that our film was, um, was maybe going to be too much like that. Uh, I told him it wasn't. I told him that, you know, it was it was a complimentary film because obviously the Jackie Robinson story is the Jackie Robinson story. And we were going to pick that up and, and go forward, you know, uh, with it. Um, but they decided that they didn't want both films. Uh, and so we were kind of uh, orphaned is what happened. 
And so that's why it ended up as being a broadcast hour, uh, which is about 42, 43 minutes. And then the rest is, you know, advertisements, um, which we were, which, which we spared you tonight. Uh, Cause I have, I still have the file on my computer. Um, but yeah, no, we had, listen, I mean, you make a film like this um, and there were lots and lots of great stories. Uh, Deacon told a great story that is still one of my favorite stories um, that we, we didn't use. Um, and it, it has a lot to do with, you know, when you, um, when you put something into a film, you have to cover it with something. You have to have footage. You have to have some way of getting through whatever the story is. Um, but Deacon told the story, and maybe he'll tell it later, um, about how his, uh, his wife protested um, the seating arrangements, uh, I believe in Savannah. Is that right, Deacon? Yes. Yeah, yes. which is a great... Yeah. It was a great story, and he and he told it beautifully. Um, it just, you know, it's one of the many things that just didn't make the cut. Um, and that's always the case with a film. You know, you're going to have things that, for whatever reason, you know, don't fit or take you off in a different direction that you don't necessarily want to go off in. Um, so yeah, yeah, we had we had we had a lot more. I mean, we had a lot more. Thanks. Gasper, I have a question for you. Sure. How did you originally come to decide to tell this particular story? Well, again, uh, Matthew Jacobson, who's in the film, he's one of the historians in the film. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, Matt was writing a, a, uh, a cultural history of the civil rights movement. And he had a chapter on Dick Allen. Um, and Dick Allen uh, integrated the Arkansas Travelers in 1963, as Cookie Rojas tells us in the film, they, they had never had a black player, right? And they sent Dick Allen down to Little Rock, Arkansas. And I mean, listen, I'm, I'm never, you know, no one should ever question or diminish, you know, what Jackie Robinson did in 1947. But Brooklyn was, you know, in New York, right? Um, and there were lots and lots of people watching what was happening. You know, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas in 1963, um, minor league baseball, and you're the only black player, um, you're kind of behind God's back. Um, and Matt really got interested in that. You know, he got interested in the idea that, you know, 15 years after Jackie Robinson, you know, frankly, six or seven years after he retired, um, you still had these players like Dick Allen who were making their way through the minor league system um, in places that were um, inhospitable to say the least um, to integration or desegregation. And so really it, Matt called me and said, hey, you know, I'm really interested in these stories. You know, do you think we can make a film out of this? And, you know, I thought about it and I said, yeah, I think we can. And one of the things that was exciting for me was to um, not just, you know, hear from people like um, Deacon um, and Jimmy Wynn and those guys, um, but to take the story, you know, of, of desegregation, frankly, much, further into the present than we normally assume. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm 53, right? So I remember I was eight, nine, 10 years old uh, when JR was pitching and Enos Cabell was playing, you know, third base for the Astros. And, you know, uh, I remember that team very well. Um, Reggie Jackson, right? You know, I didn't necessarily think of those figures as being part of the desegregation of baseball. You're like, oh no, those guys, those guys played in the seventies and the eighties, you know? Um, but when you step back and you look at what they went through and you hear those stories, you realize that those players, you know, that the seventies and the eighties 
are much closely, much more closely connected to the desegregation of baseball than I think a lot of us would like to admit. Um, you know, and the story goes on. So uh, that was exciting for me, you know, um, to be able to kind of expand um, the way that we talk about desegregation in baseball. You know, it's not just this thing that happened, you know, between 1947 and 1959, you know, um, when the Red Sox finally, you know, you know, the last team to integrate. Um, but in fact, it's, it's a story that, that goes on for decades. Um, so that was, again, that was the impetus for the film. Hmm. Anyone else? Uh, I just wonder if, uh, did they have the same problems in the minor leagues in the North as they had in the South? Um, well, I can let Deacon, I mean, Deacon should answer that. Um, my sense was not, I mean, not as much. I mean, um, Mudcat Grant, I think, had an easier time in the North, and he was there in the 50s. Yeah. Um, the Latin guys, you know, like, the Latin guys had the language barrier. Yeah. Um, and so that was the same, whether you were, you know, Tony Perez, um, played in Macon, Georgia. Before playing in Macon, he played, I think, in the New York Penn League in 1960. Um, and again, the language issue was the same. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Pena, Orlando, Orlando Pena telling that story about the team leaving for a road trip. You know, he said, he, he actually told another story where his catcher, uh, so Orlando played for Daytona in the Florida State League. They, the team, the manager changed the pitching signs, but nobody could communicate this to Pena. So he had to wait until another, until they played another team that had a player who spoke English and Spanish. And the other player explained that. Now, they didn't tell the other player what the signs were, but they explained to him that they had changed the signs and to tell Pena that they had changed the signs. Um, and that was enough for him to figure out what the new signs were. Um, but again, I mean, can you imagine, you know, you're a 20 year old kid and you're trying to make the big club and as a pitcher uh, and they change the signs on you and there's nobody there to tell you what the new signs are, you know? Um, so, but yeah, but I mean, I think, I mean, Deacon played up North and in the South. So I don't know, Deacon, if you want to pick that up. I'm sorry. What's that? In the North, in the North, playing in the North. No, no issues, it's up. Uh, um, The only real issues I had in the North when I left home for the first time, going to college, you know, I thought college was going to be so great. I was going to join the sorority and all of that. Sorority? First sorority. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Well, but I didn't, you know, and uh, we ended up, I had to stay in the YMCA. Couldn't stay at a fraternity house or nothing like that. And then, of course, we went down south to, to the uh, southern trip in spring training. You know, was Sid, uh, bus, the bus driver name was Sid, and he had to take the wife all players to the hotel. We had to find a place to stay with the whole family somewhere along the line down there. Those were the only issues I had with really the But, uh, you know, the one question out of all of this that we see today, and people would ask me many times, how did you do it? How did you guys do that? And still maintain your concentration. Well, we thought of it as this way. Remember, when the black ball players came in to play against us, they had to come to our neighborhood to eat and sleep, right? 
So after we did battle with the restaurant, we were talking about all our problems. It was just like an AA meeting, if you will. No, God would tell the story. It was very interesting. And we all exchanged telephone numbers, and we made a vow. He said, don't lose it. Don't lose it, guys, because that's all they want us to do. And of course, that didn't hold true with a lot of us, myself particularly. I could tell you that story, but that's for another time. But uh, I think that was the hardest thing to understand. We said, let's play ball good. Let's get out of here. We'll have to deal with these people. We're not trying to change the world and up. We just want to get out of here, develop our skills, and get to the big leagues. Hey, could you, you tell us a story that he talked about uh, concerning your Well, that's going to take some time, <laughs> and it's quite a story. Uh, I don't know if we have the time. To okay, I, but time I call my wife and Don Buford's wife the Rosa Parks of baseball. So we're sitting in, we're in Savannah, Georgia one day, and it's on Sunday. It's hot in Savannah, Georgia, okay? I'm playing first base. Don Buford is playing second. And usually the wives, they come to the ball games late. And in those ballparks there, the black people would have to sit down the left field line in the big screen, and they're down the left field line. So after the second inning, I looked up and I didn't see my wife or Don Buford's wife. And about the third inning or so, I was down my knees between pitches, and I happened to look up. I looked at the catcher and the umpire. I looked right over his head, and there was my wife and Alicia Buford's wife sitting there. And the general manager, Tom Fleming, was down on one knee talking to him. And you know, when a woman does like this, <laughs> you're in a heap of trouble. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, I'm traumatized. I said, Robbie, Robbie, second base. What was it? Ticky, Alicia, they behind her plate. No, no. The guy's making a pitch. And he said, and here we were on the right side of the infield with standing still. So, oh my God. Between and we run, I get to the corner of the dugout, and I, I'm saying, take it again, up again. <laughs> and she looks at she cuts me. <laughs> no, no, I'm not moving. I said, the view, we're going to die tonight in Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> I couldn't wait until after the game. Run up to her. I'm going to take it easy. Honey, take it easy. Alicia said, take it easy, guys. On the way to the ballpark, we decided, what the heck? We're not going to sit in that hot sun. And our husband is just as good as anybody out there on the field. We're going to sit behind home plate with the white wives to sit in the shade. And they sat there. I said, well, what did Tom Fleming say to you? He said, Mr. Jones, please move. Mr. Buford, please move. We're going to lose our sponsorships. For and when he said that to me, I wasn't moving one inch. <laughs> and so, of course, that night we came home, we talked about it. What's going to happen tomorrow, you know? And we said, Tiki, you can't do that. At least you can. That morning, you know, we as ball players, we stay up late talking because we, we finished late and we're about two o'clock in the morning. Buford lived around the corner. There's a knock on the door about nine o'clock. And we don't get up at nine o'clock in the morning, ball players. That's the plan night. And I opened the door. This is a stately man, black guys, and shirt and tie. He said, Mr. Jones, yes, I'm so and so and so. I'm head of the NAACP. I said, oh, yes. I understand you had some problems uh, the other night, uh, last night at the ball. I said, oh, now I'm getting awake. <laughs> I said, I no, we didn't have any problems. But uh, uh, well, what's this about? Well, I just want to tell you that we're going to pick at the ball player, the ballpark tonight. I said, oh, God. Here I am down the cell. I'm getting mixed up in a political thing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So he leaves. I said, well, thanks very much for letting me know. He leaves. 
I get on phone, I call Buf, comes running around. They had, they're still in the pajamas. They were so excited and we were concerned. So what should we do? What should we do? So, I don't know. So we call our manager. Oh no, so George, and I told him the story, what's gonna happen. He said, well, just sit tight, I'm gonna call Chicago. Well, he called Chicago, and we're thinking maybe we could go up to, you know, Colorado Springs or someplace like that and get out of here. Well, he comes back and I said, no, of course. And so we said, well, beautiful, what are we gonna do? He said, man, you gotta play. You can't let these people run us out of here. But they'll protect us. We have police out there. So we went, and let me tell you, when I got to the ballpark around three o'clock, I thought I was back in Harlem. I never seen so many black folks. And I never heard, I got so tired of that song, We Shall Overcome. My God, they played it all during the game outside and for two days. And finally, we went on the road. And we got a little relief. But we came back. And the second day, we still know people, not many people in this, in the, in this coming to the ballpark. And Tom Fleming called a meeting. And he said, boys, well, you see, we aren't joining any people and we're having some issues. We are going to move the team. Now, this was in June. They're going to move the whole franchise. And we're having the team meeting. And somebody says, well, where, where are we going to move it to? He said, Lynchburg, Virginia. I said, <laughs> That's why my wife and Rosa Park, and uh, Buford's wife, the Rosa Parks of baseball. Yeah, Gasper, thanks so much. And you can look it up, and you can look it up. And that team moved to Lynchburg, Virginia mid season. Yes. Um, you know, it, yeah, no, it happened. It happened. No, that and that's a great story. You know, that's a great story. Um, but again, you know, you leave stuff on the cutting room floor. Um, you know, and one thing that Deacon spoke to um, is the camaraderie that the players had, and we actually found out that that was actually true of the Latino and the black players at the time, um, because there were so few. Um, that they that they kind of found common cause. Um, I remember in the interview with Tony Perez, we asked him about Dick Allen, and Tony got a huge smile on his face, and he said, he said, he said, Dick Allen. He said, and he and I didn't realize this, but he and Dick Allen had both played in the in the New York Penn League when they were eighteen years old, and. Um, and he told me, and he told me a great story, you know, because obviously everybody knows that Dick Allen was Richie Allen when he came up. And then he said, no, I want to be Dick Allen. Tony Perez always called Dick Allen Richard. When they were 18 years old, he called him Richard. And Dick Allen called Tony Atanasio, which is Tony's full name. Um, and this was this little thing they had. Um, and they just looked forward to playing each other um, because they had a nice, uh, they had a rapport um, and they could, and they could kind of, you know, um, kind of prop each other up, you know? Um, and so there was a lot of that and there were a lot of great stories like that as well. So um, yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to? Move on to uh, Vinny, if that's okay. Gaffer, it was great. Thank you for the, thank you for sharing the film with us. Thank you for having me. I'm, and I'm glad, I'm glad Deacon was able to make it as well. Yeah, so. Yeah, right. well, I don't know who's here. We got a lot of people here. We got a full house. Yeah, we got a full house tonight. So Deacon, did they move the franchise? Yeah, they did. They, they, they did. They um, moved it. Wow. Yeah. What a story. Great story. Vinny? Yes, sir. You want to tell us about a project you're uh, 
Absol absolutely. 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 And, and again, I, first I want to thank Gaspar because uh, as part of the project, we did view your film oh, um, as some, some background information within that. Um, so, so I know several of you, it's been a while since I've uh, been able to attend in person. Uh, my name is Vinny Vratny. I'm the director of technology at the Kincaid School. Um, and one of the things that um, we have at the Kincaid School is a January term or an interim term, which is a three week term. This past January, I had the opportunity to uh, propose a course uh, which I called Making Sense of Stories and Numbers. Um, and the idea behind this course, um, which is a three week course um, in January, uh, courses range from students can choose uh, from yoga and meditation to learning how to play bridge. Students will choose up to four 70 minute classes to take over this three week period. And um, in my particular course, um, I ended up having 10 students enroll. Um, unfortunately, they were all young men. Um, at some point in time, I would like to get more women on into this. Um, and they comprised of junior, sophomores and freshmen. What I wanted to do with the making sense of stories and numbers and within this particular interim term course was to really take a look at the um, announcement by Major League Baseball when they announced that the Negro Leagues were now being recognized as a major league. And so for the students, this is the course description that uh, they saw before the signups, and this is why they signed up. But you know, what were the Negro Leagues? How did Texans shape the history of the league? Um, how can we compare the impact of these players to the established records in history of the game? Um, and I wanted them to begin to not only learn some of the analytics and some of the um, spreadsheet skills that um, will serve them well in life, but also to be able to decipher some of the oral histories of the game. And so the, the goals were to really to get them to think about the, this upcoming April with the 75th anniversary of the breaking of the color barrier the 101st anniversary of the founding of the Negro Leagues in 1920, to acknowledge that baseball's recognition of Negro League statistics as being a major league, to learn some basic research skills and, and some analytics skills, and to really think about the question that if we take a look at the population in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, less than 10% or around 10% of them played in segregated baseball at some point in time during their career. Um, were there others who played at that time in those leagues who did not, or were not afforded the opportunity, who merit consideration for inclusion to, to be there? So were there some other stars besides the cool Papa Bells and the Oscar Charlestons and, and such, the satchel pages, that because of the exclusion of those players to play against their white counterparts to, to work within there. So to get the, the course started within the first week, the first assignment that I gave them, now looking at the fact that the Astros and Colt 45s are going to be celebrating their 60th anniversary, was to give them the raw statistics um, from baseball reference and ask them to pick a 25 man roster of the all time Colt 45s and Astros players. And again, we have to remember that these are freshmen through juniors. And so they came of baseball age, about that eight to 10 years old with the Astros and with the current resurgence of the Astros. And so based upon that, this is their sampling of the various different players that they selected as being members of the um, 60th anniversary team. Now, one of the things that this then allowed us to begin to uh, have conversations about were things such as ballpark effect. Um, what was the difference between the Astrodome and Minute Maid Field? Um, you know, how can we interpret the various different pieces? And as we can, as you can probably notice within their choices, how much of a recency bias are they doing because they know these players? 
um, because they've seen them play versus all. Because we're, again, we're setting them on up to take a look at players whom they've never heard of and have never seen. U utilizing the, um, some of the clips of the film uh, with permission from Dr. Phillips, who was at the uh, November meeting, um, we I taught them a little bit about the history uh, how runs created, how war began to get calculated, and then asked them to retake a look at this, now thinking and factoring in things such as ballpark effect and such. And one of the things that you'll see is when they went back and revised their first lists, that they came to a lot more consensus in terms of the players which were selected. Um, you'll see that the highlighted players are players who are on the, out of the 10 students that there are picked seven or more times. And so, you know, you'll see that there was a little bit more consistency now that they began to build those analytic skills. So now what I, we, I asked them to do is to take a deeper dive. And we began to take a very brief look um, within a class period and a half of segregated baseball, doing a little bit of a deeper dive on Rube Foster, who Perhaps. grew up in East Texas. Um, in addition to Gaspar's film, we uh, screened the film, uh, The Other Boys of Summer, which was put out by Lauren Myers, which was a really great compliment. This film focused on interviews of players who played in the Negro Leagues uh, in the 40s and then in the 50s. Um, and one of the things that the students took on out of this, um, from this, was the fact that the integration of baseball and the slow integration of the minor leagues and things that we saw in the in Gasper's film um, really began was began that was the beacon to the ending of the Negro Leagues and the lack of jobs and the loss of jobs from for a number of these particular ball players. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of a, an ironic and bittersweet piece within that. Um, we also had the opportunity to connect with Eric Shalik. Um, and again, this is being recorded, so you can go back and, and pull the URL. But Eric, um, we, I got through Scott Simkis, through Daryl Morey, um, and he has been developing um, major league equivalencies for players in the minor leagues so that we can properly assess them. So he took the students in through some deeper analytic skills. Um, and then we had our librarians come in to work with the students on how to research archival newspapers and be able to ferret out some of those oral histories. So then students then took on and picked three to four um, major or Negro League stars um, and began to develop, a, their final project was to develop a case study. The case study was to take a look at those players and take a look at their seasons against their contemporaries in the Negro Leagues. Were they uh, consistently a star and at the upper end of the statistics as well as the stories, the honors, the accolades that were being shared? And then once they made that determination, then to begin to take a look at them versus contemporaries at the same position who played at the same eras as them who are currently in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And so we have three different categories um, of hitters um, from this, the research that the students did. And, I, and again, remembering that this was a 13 class period time, 70 minutes, um, very little homework was allowed within this. Um, there are players who they feel were worth further consideration based upon their career. Uh, John Beckwith, Rap Dixon, Vic Harris, uh, Fats Jenkins, Home Run Johnson, Tubby Scales, Wild Bill Wright. Um, additionally, there were a couple that they determined were um, stars, but not worthy of inclusion or consideration for inclusion. These would include Tank Carr, Jelly Roll Gardner. And then there was two really interesting pieces that more research was needed or more stats were needed. Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, the statistics weren't there, the, the archival and the antidotes were there to, to kind of support that. And so there was kind of a mixed consensus on that. A second player was Chino Smith. He died early um, in his career. And so if based upon 
the National Ball Baseball Hall of Fame's criteria of a player needing to play 10 years, he falls short by a year. Um, now, is if more information and more statistics are pulled um, that would be supportive of his candidacy based upon the nine years he had, he definitely is merit and worthy of consideration. Um, but at this particular point, based upon the criteria for the National Baseball Hall of Fame, he doesn't quite meet the mark. Um, they also took a look at a number of pitchers. Um, other pitcher, three pitchers emerged um, from this. And again, students got to self-select um, from a list of 88 players that I uh, helped curate along with um, Eric, um, as well as um, a, a few others um, within this, but William Bell, uh, Dizzy Dismukes and Cannonball Redding, they felt were based upon their research um, were eligible, um, but again, star pitchers and not quite worthy um, from their perspective uh, were two pitchers, Phil Cockrell and Will Jackman. Um, it was a really fascinating piece to have students uh, begin to do some research, be able to pull um, this on out. Um, students were very excited, um, very happy to have the opportunity to do this. Um, and so, you know, we just had a really, really great experience. Um, we introduced uh, 10 students to um, some of the work that many of you have done in the past in terms of doing some of the research and being able to pull out stories and be able to develop these, these case studies for players who a lot of us or some of us may not have heard of and first, first pass. All right, Vinny, that's good. Anybody got a question for Vinny? I, I, I have a question. How many of these how many of these kids were baseball fans before they started? The, the majority of them um, were baseball fans because, again, they got to self-select out of the, the catalog. So there was that interest in baseball. Um, many of them, uh, we've got a handful that are playing um, on our varsity squad or JV squad. So there, a number of them are, are baseball fans. Mike? Yeah, you mentioned something about teams that are Texas players. Texas players or just all the players? Well, we took a look at all the players. Um, I really wanted them to focus in on Rube Foster, um, particularly with his career, but then his post playing career as the owner and major player in the founding of the Negro Lakes um, in, in 1920. And so, you know, we really wanted to give them a sense of how local players influence and shape the game. He was from Kansas City, right? He had, up in Kansas City, but he, he, was, he was born and raised in East Texas. Played with the Chicago American Giants and then moved on um, and founded the Negro Leagues in the Y um, in Kansas City. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? Robert. Vinny, thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Okay. Um, because of uh, the weather situation, Herb had agreed to delay his trivia contest to May, right? Our meeting will be at the, uh, keep wanting to say skaters. <laughs> we'll be Constellation Felix. <laughs> Saturday, April the 16th, we'll have that brief little talk with high caps and um, then we'll all get a chance to eat and go to the game. So, Larry, you want to set some? Go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. Uh, Tampa got his baseball team. There were the Devil Rays. That's right. When Arizona got their team, there were the Diamondbacks. What are they now? The Rays? The Rays. And the D-backs. What are those Space Cowboys going to become? Tacos. You can't be in Cowboys in the minor league. Yes, all of us Houston fans. I want to have cheers for the Depths. 
<laughs> I'm certainly going to cheer for anything about the Cowboy <laughs> being a Houston fan. Hey, just remember, at one time, the name Astros was controversial. People thought it might get short. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were looking more at the front half. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, as a reminder, uh, please send in your Astros win contest. You can send it to me, but uh, we're just going to forward them on to Herb. I'll put his email address in the uh, write up. And um, we're just, I'm going to have the thing for the, for the newspaper uh, newsletter. They just had an analytics conference this past weekend. Uh, I didn't attend, but if anybody did who wants to summarize it, that'd be a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nothing else. We'll see you next month. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.